93% of your longevity is determined by lifestyle factors. Only 7% by genetics, what, what you've inherited. Wow. You know, some colleagues used to say that to live old, you have to choose your parents well. But, uh, you know, the data doesn't say this. It says it's on us, it's on you, it's on me to really uh, optimize your lifestyle to increase your, your health span and your lifespan. Hey everyone, I'm Raif Durazi, and in this video, I have the great pleasure of interviewing our special guest, Eric Burden. We're gonna talk about the Buck Institute, which focuses its research on aging. Part of that focus includes HIV and aging, and what that means for you and I. We'll cover some of their latest research findings as well. I'm here for the annual HOPE Collaboratory Conference, a meeting of all the scientists from around the world working on the Block Lock Stop. Previously, I've, I've mentioned it as Block Lock Excise, modality of preclinical research for an HIV cure. So a little bit about Eric. Eric Verdon is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Buck Institute for Research on Aging. A native of Belgium, Dr. Verdon received his Doctorate of Medicine from the University of Liège and completed additional clinical and research training at Harvard Medical School. He has held faculty positions at the University of Brussels, the National Institutes of Health, NIH, and the Pickhower Institute for Medical Research. Dr. Verdon is also a professor of medicine at University of California, San Francisco, Dr. Verdon joined the Buck in 2016 after spending the previous 20 years as a senior investigator at the Gladstone Institutes, where he served as associate director from 2004 to 2016. Dr. Verdon's laboratory focuses on the role of epigenetic regulators in the aging process. His laboratory was the first to clone a family of enzymes called HDAX, which regulate histone acetylation. Dr. Verdon studies how metabolism, diet, and small molecules regulate the activity of HDAX and sirtuins and thereby the aging process itself and its associated diseases, including Alzheimer's. If you didn't understand what I just said, that's okay. Just know that he studies how metabolism, diet, and small molecules impact the aging process and its associated diseases. He has published more than 210 scientific papers and holds more than 15 patents. He is a highly cited scientist and has been recognized for his research with a Glenn Award for Research in Biological Mechanisms of Aging and a senior scholarship from the Ellison Medical Foundation. He is an elected member of several scientific organizations, including the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, and the Association of American Physicians. He also serves on the Advisory Council of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the NIH. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for sitting through that with me. There's a lot you. to cover. How are you? It's very good, how are you? I'm excellent. Uh, first of all, when I read your bio, I was in awe and reminded just how much a person can accomplish in one lifetime uh, with the right amount of focus, a sense for purpose, and a true passion. Um, I'll start with a, a general question that I ask all my guests, and that is, what is your current assessment of the global HIV AIDS epidemic? Well, we've reached a, a really interesting uh, stage in which, you know, because of, of all the work that's been uh, invested in and, and by, by friends and colleagues, we have drugs that actually work. And, and that by itself is a, is a remarkable achievement. When I went to medical school, we were told that um, the 20th century would be looked at the century of when we conquered bacterial diseases. But we also were told that uh, there would never be treatments uh, for viral infections, uh, except for vaccines. And in some way, the, the HIV you know, pandemic really showed us the way that now we have drugs, you know, targeting HIV, we can suppress it, but not only HIV, we can cure hepatitis C yeah. and, and, and the list goes on. So there's been a, an incredible paradigm shift. That being said, you know, what we all recognize the incredible sort of success of, of these drugs in, in, in allowing patients to survive and to thrive. Uh, we all recognize that this is far from a cure. So I think that the reason we're here this weekend at the Buck is really uh, to work. I'm, I'm part of the, the HOPE uh, uh, collaboratory is really to, to go to the next stage. And, you mm -hmm. know, we have six patients who have been uh, cured from the HIV. Everyone recognizes this is a momentous achievement, but we also recognize that the treatment that have been used are heavy, risky, and certainly not something that we can implement in, in the millions of people who are living right. with HIV. So I think the, the next stage is really, can we bring the same uh, knowledge, the same hard work, and, and, and a little bit of luck maybe to, you know, to mm -hmm. bring a cure to, to everyone who's infected with HIV. And I, I really, I'm an optimist. I think the power of science has showed us, you know, what we can do when we, when we focus and we tackle. So 
this whole topic of uh, HIV cure is really uh, is, is the frontier right now of mm. HIV research. And hopefully, you know, we can come back in five years and say we did it. Uh, so, so really excited by, by what's happening. Yeah. And isn't it true that HIV research also informs research into other diseases as well? Like the I, 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 vaccines for COVID I, I, even? Absolutely. I think there is... Um, you know, it's it's hard for people who are not in the field to understand this, but there there is no research in any field that does not impact other fields. For example, um, through our work on HIV, we ended up cloning the HDAX. Now, you know, your, your audience may not be familiar with the HDAX, but uh, you probably have heard about the, those treatments that were initially proposed for a cure, which was the the idea of reactivating the virus. What that was based on are cloning the HDACs and showing mm. that the HDAC inhibitors were actually able to force the reactivation of the virus. Is that the reservoirs awakening? Exactly. Mm. And now, you know, the field, at least this, this uh, HOPE collaboratory is switching in a slight, slightly different direction. We, we're not sure that reactivating the virus is the best way. We mm. think just locking it in uh, is, is going to be key. And believe it or not, the enzymes, the HDACs and, and the whole epigenetic regulation we think it points the way, points to the, the levers that we have in cells that will allow us to lock the virus in. Okay. Great. So, so basically, I mean, there's, you know, research in any field, research in cancer has helped us advance work on HIV and work on viruses has helped us in many other directions. So it's a whole intricate sort of web yeah. of, of work. And so, you know, the, the best scientists actually stay attuned to what's happening in many different mm -hmm. fields because you never know what you're going to be learning from colleagues who are studying a completely different process. That's such a great insight. Okay, well, I'm... I'm sure everyone at, at home or on the other side of the screen is excited to hear what you have to say about aging. But before we dive into that, I would love to learn a little bit more about you personally. Um, can you tell us what drew you specifically into the work of aging? Was there like a moment? Was there an experience that you went through? Yes, there, 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 were, there were a couple. First, the personal history of my father, mm -hmm. uh, who was... Um, you know, smoking for a big part of his life. And, you know, when as kids we were anxious about this, we would ask him and his answer, well, you have to die from something. And, and so, uh, and we saw indeed, you know, some of his close friends die in their 50s from heart attacks. And mm. so uh, th this is something that sort of colored my youth, mm. the idea that feeling your father being vulnerable to a fatal heart attack. Uh, so that was something, and, and eventually, you know, he, he did die from lung cancer, which was directly linked to uh, to smoking, but he died at 77, and I, I really could not help to think that, you know, had he not smoked, he could have lived an extra 15 years, and he, yeah. might, he would still be here today. So yeah. that there's a part of me that thought, okay, uh, lifestyle, the way you choose your life, really will have an enormous impact on, on your on your longevity, and, and we know this, this is what the data says. 93% of your longevity is determined by lifestyle factors, only 7% by genetics, what, what you've inherited. Wow. You know, some colleagues used to say that to live old, you have to choose your parents well, but uh, you know, the data doesn't say this. It says it's on us, it's on you, it's on me to really uh, optimize your lifestyle to increase your, your health span and your lifespan. Now, the other so that was the personal aspect. Uh -huh. The more professional aspect is we ended up cloning this family of proteins, the HDACs you mentioned in your introduction, that played a key role in, in the regulation of HIV and its silencing. And it turns out these proteins are so involved in the aging process. And so about uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when we discovered these proteins, um, I realized you know, there is another side to, to the HDACs, not just HIV. And we, by the way, we're still working on HDACs and HIV to this day. But um, the aging just drew me because there was a personal connection mm -hmm. from my father. And just um, I started focusing a part of my lab on, on studying aging. And eventually we made a number of discoveries which led me to being recruited here to direct this institute, mm -hmm. uh, which allowed me to sort of bring my work, you know, I continue to run a lab here, but also to bring my work to a, not, a bigger stage, basically, yeah. the idea of directing an, an organization and, and becoming a sort of a, a leader in, in the field of aging research. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I can, I can certainly relate to your father. Uh, my stepfather was also smoking his, most of his life, 
and he died at 54 of, of a heart attack. Well, so, well, you it? know, and the number, the, the percentage, 93%, I bet, I'm sure a lot of people watching are shocked to hear that that big of a percentage is based on lifestyle. And my question would be, um, can lifestyle actually manipulate genes, turning on and off switches also? Yes, completely. And okay. actually, I always tell people that, um, so this is a field called epigenetics. So think mm -hmm. about your DNA is the code, uh, you know, how, how it's written. We cannot change this. Mm -hmm. You're born with the genes from your parents, and that plays a role in your longevity to some degree, only about 7% for most of us. There, there's some exception to this, the centenarians, for example, and we, we can discuss this. But on top of this layer of genetics, there's epigenetics, which regulates how these genes that you inherit are actually expressed. Mm -hmm. And our epigenome is highly sensitive to the environment. And this is how the environment basically... So you think about the, the, um, the genetics or the genetic code as um, a score for a piece of music. We know that on top, for the same score, you can give it to 20 conductors, they will play a different music. Right? They, will, they will all have their own interpretation. Mm -hmm. And so our epigenome epigenetics really is highly attuned to the environment. And that includes uh, if you have a meal, if you have, a, and people don't realize it, if you have a meal, your pattern of gene expression will change. So all of these genes that are fixed will start expressing at different level depending on what you eat. Mm -hmm. For example, if you choose to have a greasy meal, <laughs> your epigenome will go in one direction. Yeah. And if you have a healthy meal, we'll go in another direction. Mm. And so our the focus of our work is understanding all of the, uh, there's a term for this, it's called the exposome, all of these external influences, mm. the air you breathe, the toxins you are exposed to, exercising, uh, the food you eat, everything will eventually affect the expression of your genes and thereby your health and your longevity. Mm. I think that's really empowering to hear for people living with HIV when you start to hear that there are comorbidities associated with having chronic inflammation, that you can really take back a lot of that, that initiative, the power. And I think what I've just told you for the general population, uh -huh. I would say applies even more to people with HIV who are already at increased risk. So I would say the, the potential mm. positive effect of modulating these risk factors by lifestyle is even greater. And one of the, you know, so that's one layer of the whole aging field right now is really understanding, you know, what are the factors that, yeah. that are affecting your longevity? Yeah. And everyone knows them. It, you know, if I name them, you'll say, yes, I've heard this. Nutrition, mm -hmm. physical activity or exercise, yeah. uh, stress and sleep. Uh, human connections, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great example of what we have here at this meeting yeah. where you know, there's a lot of community building, so having friends, being loved, all of these things actually do affect your epigenome, which is a uh, frontier in science. This is the hardest thing to study because our, our laboratory animals, and you know, we don't know how they feel about each other, mm -hmm. but we know in humans all of these variables affect your lifespan and your health span. So, one of the focus of our work here at the Institute is really to try to, to bring some molecular details, understanding what is it about food that actually make, can make you either sick mm -hmm. or healthy. Yeah. Uh, food is the same potential. What forms of exercise should you be, you know, will, will give you the biggest benefit? Um, what forms of, um, you know, how much sleep do you need? And so on and, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. I'm curious, I wanted to ask you, maybe this is a little bit of, of, of a personal question for me, uh, what, what drives you to accomplish so much? Um, and, and most importantly, what's the secret to managing so many, so many things? And uh, having that, what you said is yes. so important, the human connection. What drives me? I think it, it's a really good question. And actually, by the way, uh, having a sense of purpose mm. is one of the most important things that you can do for your longevity. Uh, the people who are driven, who, who have the feeling they're here for a reason, mm -hmm. uh, tend to live longer and they're more happy. So um, what drives me? I, 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 for, I, watch, I would like you to consider for one second the likelihood that you would be alive. And so when you, when you look at, you know, where you're coming from, um, if any of your ancestors in the last three billion years 
had been eaten a little too early, you would not be here. So the fact that we are a unique product mm -hmm. of a chain of event that goes back three billion years ago, and for which there could have been so many events, mm -hmm. a car accident, or, or you know someone eating your you know <laughs> eating your ancestor or your ancestor going to war and not coming back so the likelihood that each of us would be alive is is an incredible miracle mm. and i've felt this since the first day i mean not since the first day but since very young we only have one life mm. we're here for a short time and I love living as as we yeah, all do. Yeah. So why not make the best of this very precious time that you have and actually try to contribute? So to me, that's really the sense of awe oh, that I'm so lucky to be here, to be alive, and let's make the very, very best that I can. And every day that I wake up, I start thinking, oh my God, gratitude for being here. Let's make this the very special day. Where do you think that comes from? Because you said you, you felt that at, at a very early yeah. age. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's I mean, something that to study maybe is, it, is it, how... I think it comes from, uh, from reflection. It comes from, um, from ha having been lucky to have good parents mm. who raised me well. Mm. You know? so it comes from, from many, many different things, but uh, it, it, it's also something that can be taught. Okay. I, I, and just sharing this, this simple nugget of information, you know, think about how unlikely it is that you would be here. Yeah. Most people don't spend any time thinking about this, but once you realize, they say, wow, I'm here and it's finite. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm 66, which means that uh, this is an age at which you start sensing your mortality in a, in a, in a bit of a more acute way. And that, that even accelerates my, my, my desire to really make the best of it. Mm. And the, the second thing is you mentioned, you know, how, how, where do you find the energy? I think, or, or the drive, part of it for me has been that uh, the more I pay attention to my well-being, mm. my physical mm. ability, okay. the, the more I can do. And I have more energy. I, I, I claim this, and I probably will make some 20-year-old laugh, but I, I claim that I have more energy and more drive today than I had in my whole entire life. And wow. I think part of it being driven by, by the fact that I pay more attention to mm. how I live, so living consciously about your, mm. your, your body and trying to really optimize what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. Perfect answer. So, so another secret to managing so many moving parts, is, as you ask, is the fact that um, I hear from a lot of people when I tell them you have to optimize your lifespan, you have to start being physically active. Well, people tell me I don't have the time mm -hmm. uh, to exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and my argument is, is, is exactly the opposite. Once you start exercising or, or just you know, spending time on yourself, you will find that your resources, your efficiency, your enthusiasm, your positivity, all of this is going to be increased. So I can, you know, mope around at home and feeling sorry for myself and being tired and, and not accomplish anything. Or you can drive yourself a little bit, pay attention to the machine, which is ourselves, mm -hmm. and then your productivity will increase. And so in some way, I never buy the argument. You know, I talk to a lot of people about physical activity and they tell me, well, I, I just can't do this. I say, well, yes, you can. It just has to be number one priority, yeah. you know, and once yeah. that is yeah. a priority, everything else becomes easier. Absolutely. So well said. Couldn't agree more. I'm actually a, uh, a competitive natural bodybuilder. Yeah. And that was part of my journey when I, after being di diagnosed with AIDS was reclaiming my body and not being a victim anymore. And uh, yeah, you, you, once you make the time and it starts to give you energy, once you give it in, in the beginning, it's an investment. And then after a while it starts to give you energy and it's like, and by the way, it works for you because you look extremely healthy. So <laughs> Thank you. It's that, and I, you know, after a while, when you're in this business and you talk to people, I can recognize someone who's a, who's a you know, 38, 38 years old. Fantastic. Well, and fantastic. You're, you're doing a good job. <laughs> okay. I read on the website, the Buck is the first independent biomedical research institute in the world focused solely on aging. The mission is to end the threat of age-related disease for this and future generations. I'm curious, what does that mean that it's an independent institute? Oh, independent simply means that we're not affiliated to a big university. So okay. we, we collaborate with, mm -hmm. you know, UCSF, Berkeley, Stanford, all, all of the the you know, UC Davis, the, the, the organizations that are mm -hmm. part of our ecosystem here and actually across the country and across the world. Mm -hmm. But we have 
we are in the independently managed we have our you know our own grants and which gives us um i think some degree of nimbleness that you might not have if you're part of a yeah. a, a giant institution yeah. so i that that that's all it means okay uh, regarding our aging bodies, you mentioned in your talk uh, a distinction between intrinsic aging and immune aging, and that HIV impacts one more than the other. Can you speak to what each type of aging is and how it impacts how HIV impacts each differently? Yes. So there are. Um, it's a bit of a difficult question to answer, but I'll, I'll try okay. to simplify it. Uh, there have been a number of papers claiming that uh, HIV, uh, uh, people with HIV actually age at an accelerated rate. Mm -hmm. And what, so we, and this has been based on, on markers that people call epigenetic clocks. And so recently, and so I've always accepted it, okay, you know, we know patients, uh, people with HIV, on average, tend to live a little shorter. Uh, they also tend to to show an, an increase in what we call the chronic disease of aging, the, mm. the comorbidities, mm -hmm. heart attacks, and and some other complications. Uh, but when the clocks were used to measure aging, and we have these tools that allow you to determine not only what is your chronological age, how many years you've lived, but what where is your biological age? Mm. Where are you? Are you a person who is aging faster or slower? So these clocks actually are being used in, in, in the setting of, of our research. But I was always um, a little bit wary of the data that, that claimed that HIV-infected people were, were showing true accelerated aging. And there's, there's some degree of skepticism from other people. Mm. So um, what we have found is we have generated a new clock which measures real aging. Uh, and I'll, I'll come to, to to say what I mean by real aging. And this clock actually shows a very minimal acceleration in HIV in people with HIV, about two years. Oh, wow. You know, thinking okay. about a year, a life expectancy of 80, two years is almost negligible. Yeah. I mean, that's probably, it's, it's smaller than the genetic variation. Yeah. Um, so what is it that the old clocks was measuring and we've come to, uh, through our work here at the Institute, we've come to realize that, that the traditional epigenetic clocks are not really measuring, that they're a mixture of multiple things. They're measuring multiple things, what we call intrinsic aging and extrinsic aging. So mm -hmm. intrinsic aging, the core of aging is not changed during HIV infection. What has changed is chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we think that the existing clocks are a mixture of the two together. So we've been able to split ah. them. And so we know, you know, another example, there have been some papers recently published so, saying that COVID infection is associated with a seven year or actually 15 year acceleration of aging. And typical COVID infection is three weeks. From a biological standpoint, it just doesn't make any sense that you would age 15 years in, in three weeks. <laughs> it's just, just this is not how biology works. Mm. And actually, our new clock, the one that I mentioned, the intrinsic clock, shows yeah. no change in interest, intrinsic wow. aging. However, COVID, acute COVID infection and untreated HIV infection have two things in common. And one thing in common, which is they're both associated with a massive activation of the immune system. Yeah. And so our other disease, rheumatoid arthritis, many autoimmune diseases, all of these diseases have been reported to show an acceleration of the clock. So I think our work is trying to really dissect what do these clocks really tell us. Mm -hmm. And so what, it, what they tell us is that there is no change of, of aging rate, intrinsic aging rate during HIV infection, but there's definitely a massive chronic immune activation, which mm -hmm. is suppressed by the treatment, by the way. So mm. I think our, our message is one of, of positive, uh, positive message that we should focus on this chronic immune activation by suppressing the virus. And we know, for example, that in HIV, even in patients who are, in people who are infected but treated, there's still some degree of virus churning. This is why you cannot stop the therapy. Yeah. So the, the whole block and lock by suppressing this remaining virus, I predict will also eliminate this little remaining chronic Im immune activation mm -hmm. and might enhance the health of people. Okay. So I, does it make sense? Yeah. It's a bit of a complicated it concept, does. but uh, uh, it, it's, from, for me, it's one that's positive because it means, uh, it means you can really affect chronic immune mm -hmm. activation by lifestyle yeah. factors and so on. And if you can target that infl chronic inflammation, you could potentially 
reverse that aging down process. to zero. Amazing. That's that's we will get there. Okay. I'm, I'm convinced. Okay. Okay. Um, what does the future hold for the possibility of elongating our lives? And in some respects, more importantly, enriching the experience of the life that we are living. No one wants to live until they're 150, knowing they're going to spend the last 50 years, you know, with, without mobility or being able to do or experience the things that they love. Yes. So the future is, is actually is, is quite bright. Our lifespan has increased, as, as you know, in 1840, we were living to, eight, to 38 on average. 38. Just, just let this wow. sink in for one second. This is only 150, 170 years ago. And what we've done through sanitation, medicine, vaccination, antibiotics, and all of this mm -hmm. is essentially eliminate most of infectious disease, obviously not HIV. And so this has resulted in, um, in people living much longer. And in, in this country, it's 78 approximately, I mean, between mm -hmm. 76 and 80. Um, but along with this uh, increase in lifespan, we've seen a massive increase in what we call the chronic disease of aging and heart attacks, stroke, Parkinson, Alzheimer's, um, uh, what, what else is there? Macular degeneration, uh, loss of sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass, mm. uh, hearing loss, glaucoma. Uh, I mean, the list goes on. And we see this around in our parents or in our families. It really degrades, the, even though we have all these extra years, degrades the quality of what we, we yeah. live. And if you reach 65, 70 percent of people carry at least one of these diseases. By 70, at least most people carry two of these chronic diseases. Mm. So we equate aging with getting sick. And mm -hmm. what we have found through our work is that the same factors, the dials that were the levers that we've identified that allow us to regulate the rate of aging, also regulate the rate at which you get sick. And so the promise of our field and our work is really to help people live better longer. This yeah. is like the tagline from the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason we chose this is this is something that we can do in the laboratory setting. When we tinker with aging pathways that we've identified, uh, animals live longer, but they also live healthier. Mm. And that's the promise for humans. Now imagine, you know, living to 100 and and instead of spending 15% of your lifespan afflicted by all these disease, you would spend 5%. This is what the centenarians today do. They live to 100 and they live to 95 in good health. So they have five years of rapid decline mm. and then they pass away. Wow. Most of us, as I mentioned, we live to 80 or 76, 78 and we start getting sick at 65. Yes. That's 15% of our lives. So, uh, we know today also there's incredible health disparities. Some people are living on average, like there's a community here in Marin County that lives to 88 on average. That's, that could be done today. Yeah. And I can tell you that whole town is not all optimized in terms of lifespan. So despite this, they're living to 88 mm. on average. But we have other communities here in California who live to 68 on average, yeah. all determined by lifespan. So. Uh, the promise of our field and what we're trying to accomplish is really uh, increasing health span, making people not only live longer, but also living better. Mm -hmm. And it can be, it's done in the laboratory setting, and I predict that we will do it in humans as well. Is, the, is, is there also an observational component, especially with, um, now, now we have a whole cohort of people that are aging with HIV. Is there research that's done simply observing their yes. lifestyle and the way that they age? Exactly. So typically, I mean, if you think about how uh, the aging field works, it's typically you start with observational study. Mm -hmm. You try to see, okay, these people are living short, these people are living old, uh, old. What's the difference between them? And you try to tease out the factors that mm -hmm. are associated. Now, association is not causation. You know, the fact that, for example, people who floss their teeth <laughs> uh, live five years on average than people mm -hmm. who don't floss. That's a typical example. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that flossing your teeth will make you live five years longer, but it, it indicates that if you're flossing your teeth, you are likely are the type of person who pays attention to everything else. Yeah, and that's it's, typically the headline that you'll see in yes. online is 
people who floss live five years longer yes. and, and people make the incorrect yes. connection. So a correlation is not causation. Yeah. Uh, the hard part of the job, so it's easy to find all these associations. Mm -hmm. You know, vegetarians live a little long, uh, later. Yeah. Is it because they're vegetarians or is it because it reflects, again, uh, predisposition to paying attention? Mm -hmm. so, um, so a lot of our work right now here at the Buck is very focused on proving the causation mm -hmm. and identifying interventions that will have the maximum impact on people's health. And in this case, exercise, I, I, I hate to go back to this, physical activity, yeah, important. Uh, physical activity, and I'm using that term deliberately instead of physical exercise, because yeah. a lot of people will tell you, I don't like to sweat, I don't like mm -hmm. to exercise, therefore I don't do anything. I'll take the car to go to a store where it would be a 10 minutes walk, and I'll, <laughs> I'll take the car. So mm -hmm. physical activity is the biggest intervention that we have today if you want to maximize your health span and mm -hmm. your lifespan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, an example earlier of someone gardening, rigorously yes. gardening. Yes. That's considered, because I don't think people think of it. It's like you said, it's been trained in our minds to think of, of fitness, of exercise, of working out, not perhaps day to day activities or hobbies, things that we love to do oh, as well. You know, th there are studies showing that um, if you walk 25 minutes a day, and 25 minutes a day, I'll, I'll, I'll split it in two. That's 12 minutes in the morning, 12 minutes in the evening, <laughs> which I would venture to say anybody can make the time, time. for this, no matter right. how stressed you are, that those 15 minutes in the morning or 15 minutes yeah. at night, that will result in a 40% decrease in heart attacks, wow. stroke, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, everything, mm -hmm. year over year, 40% mm -hmm. decrease. So... Um, to me, this is a number, and, and despite this, 80% of the American population does not do mm -hmm. any physical activity. Yeah. So again, for your audience, um, if, I, if I can leave you with one message for today, um, starting tomorrow, just spend that 30 minutes. It will be the best investment you can possibly make for your own health. And like you said, paying attention means planning, planning yes. for it. Sometimes yes. you have to plan. Okay, I give myself 20... 12, 15 minutes yes. in the morning before I do whatever and then at night? Wake up a little earlier. Routine. For me, the routine, for example, um, I, I, I do exercise. I do more than 30 minutes because the, the, re the effect doesn't stop at 40%. The more you exercise up to a certain point, mm -hmm. um, the better the benefits. Yeah. But um, you get a big jump just by that first 30 minutes. But for example, a trick. You know, no one wants to exercise in the morning. When I get up, the last thing I want is to, to do physical activity. Mm -hmm. I want to sit down, mm -hmm. have coffee, read the newspaper, and yeah. so on. So first thing, like the night before, I'll prepare my bag so, to go to the gym. Yes. And so there's no decision to be made yes. in the morning. The only decision I have to do is to carry my bag, mm -hmm. get in the car, and mm -hmm. go to the gym. Yeah, the so preparation. The preparation, that, that these little tricks actually really go a long yeah. way. And then once you're doing, you get into a routine, you will see that you will benefit from it. Yeah. Uh, and then it becomes somewhat addictive in uh -huh. a way. You, I feel Absolutely. so much better. Why should I do not more? Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, COVID showed, showed us the level of distrust that exists between community and between science researchers and healthcare, um, how can we rebuild and continue to strengthen that trust? This is a great question. And it's one that really uh, preoccupies me. Uh, you know, we saw COVID vaccines were a miracle of modern medicine, developed in one year, mm -hmm. actually allowed us to get control of the pandemic. And the way, the way we live today is a reflection of this, not, not the virus getting tired. <laughs> um, but it also showed an incredible disparity in terms of which communities trusted us. You know, the, the name of Dr. Fauci being demonized. I mean, mm -hmm. these are uh, things that I take um, uh, personally, sort of politicization of the whole scientific discourse. All of these are really troubling. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to finish on a, on a positive sign, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, the work that the HIV uh, uh, community has actually done. First, you know, at the beginning, I remember ACT UP uh, 30 years ago. The first reaction was, wow, I mean, these people are crazy. There was, as a scientist at that point, I thought they're not with us. And I, I've credited mm. um, Tony Fauci for his 
uh, willingness and his ability to engage the community and to actually work with them and mm -hmm. to actually get to the point where HIV is showing the way. The fact at this scientific meeting, the HOPE meeting, we have uh, a very strong community presence, you, and engaging with the scientists, mm -hmm. uh, the scientists listening to the community. It, mm -hmm. It's not enough uh, for us to be standing in our ivory towers and to design treatment and to hand them down to the populace. This is, yeah. Th yeah. This is an old model, it's paternalistic, uh, it, it doesn't engage. So I, uh, and you know, we're confronted with the same thing in the aging field. Mm -hmm. We now know today many interventions that will make you live longer. And I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded when I go in a community and I talk to people and I hear, well, you know, you got to die of some, something like my father mm, used to say. Or, or, you know, I, I, don't want, I don't want any anti-aging medicine. It's just because people don't understand what we're trying to do, yeah. what is the purpose. So I think as um, scientists, as physicians, I, it is extremely important that we engage with the community mm -hmm. and build, uh, build the support. Now, is it easy? Uh, am I delusional that this is going to happen? But I, I think it has been accomplished in the HIV, in, in, for HIV in, in a remarkable, it might not be perfect, but it is, I can guarantee you that, um, uh, so Yat, who is also my wife, uh, you know, was planning this meeting and planning the grants. Mm. She is taking this to heart. And I think it, uh, there's nothing more satisfying for me as a scientist to participate to a meeting uh, with the community and trying to engage, learn from them. Uh, you know, we heard two talks yesterday, uh, last evening from two uh, people with HIV. And, I mean, I cannot tell you how inspiring it is for me as a scientist to sort of redouble our efforts and, mm -hmm. and to, to work in this yeah. direction. So I think, um, I hope we will be able to do this on a broader scale. Yeah. I'm, I'm inspired. Um, I was telling Melanie yesterday and the other two PIs that when I came on, I really wanted to not just be the voice for community for, for you all and the scientists and researchers, but also to be able to learn at least enough of the science that I can translate it into yes. a way that's understandable for community. And I was heartened because all the scientists and researchers are so open and willing to talk just as you are right now. And I think that is also important, you sitting here and explaining things, but then also more importantly, realizing that you're not just a, a lab coat, you're a human being and you have that's your personal life and your personal yes. passions and your concerns and fears and things affect you just like they do everyone else. Yeah. So when people know that there are humans really fighting every day, countless humans yeah. for our, our community, I think that's that helps. It helps solidify the bond and also yeah prevents us from running in the direction that we think we know what's good for you. Uh, and But we don't, mm -hmm. you know, we're mm -hmm. not living uh, yeah. these problems. We're not confronted with them on a daily basis. That's why the two talks from the cured uh, mm -hmm. uh, people was so inspiring, you know, describing mm -hmm. everything that they went through and what they want, what they don't want. So I, I think it's a model for not only from for HIV, but pretty much healthcare in yes. general. Yeah. I think there's no way. Um, I, I mean, again, another example of this is the fact that we know what you should be doing for your health, and people are not doing it. Right. It's not a logical decision. No. It's an it's emotional. it's an emotional decision, yeah. and it's one that's built on human connections. Right. And and and, and also seeing examples, mm -hmm. you know, culture, uh, culture. So. We've, we've got a lot of work to do, <laughs> yeah. but, but I think, you know, that shouldn't stop us from trying. Exactly. As we start to bring the ship into shore here, uh, what, what, what does Eric do when he's done at the end of the day, kicks off his shoes, and it's time for you, for yourself? Uh, well, I, I, I really look at uh, physical activity and sport as one of the, you know, one of the joys, but mm -hmm. also I have a family, I have three children, mm. Uh, a wife, a, a spouse, so I, I love friends, so I love spending time with them. Mm -hmm. I think human connections is, is, a, yeah. is, is a great thing. You know, we thrive on this, and yeah. we've seen what happens when we actually get taken away yeah. during COVID. Um, uh, as a hobby, I, I also am a passion uh race car driver mm, wow so, cool so it, <laughs> that'll get your really, adrenaline doesn't really seem uh compatible with longevity <laughs> but in my case it just uh forces me to stay fit because it's very physically demanding yeah it also uh, stimulates my brain 
uh, you know, forces me to really stay on top of my game. And so that that's okay. what Eric does on, on the weekend. Yeah. So you're you're definitely an example living what you espouse in your work. Trying to. Yeah. And it's, a, you know, it's not always easy. You know, some people say, oh, my God, you're a renaissance man. You're doing all of these <laughs> things. Well, you have to you have to you have to work hard at it. Yeah. And life is is just uh, not a given. Yeah. I mean, it is a given. You're lucky to be here. But what you make of it is, is at the yeah. end of the day is, is depending yeah. on you. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to share or discuss today that we haven't covered? No, I think a sense uh, maybe the last thing for me is uh, I was stunned when I saw the study that showed the relative proportion of the effect of genetics versus lifestyle because it, it's a it's a it's an mm, empowering yeah. message. It means it's on you, it's yeah. on me. You can choose the type of life that you're going to have. Uh, it I mean it's easy to say it's personal responsibility and so on, but I really view it as a journey and I can tell you from my personal journey, the more I work at being healthy, the more I derive joy from life. Mm. And and HIV should not be in the way of this mm. today with the therapies. If you, mm. if you get the therapies that you know medical care brought us, and then you add on top of it an optimization of your health span and your lifespan using lifestyle factors, um, you're going to find yourself more and more wanting to live, basically. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so to me, it's a, it's a, it's an empowering and positive message, uh, and it applies to everyone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Perfectly said. Where can folks go to follow you and or your work? Well, uh, probably the easiest would be uh, the Buck Institute has a website, uh, which actually could serve as an introduction. Uh, it's uh, uh, buckinstitute.org. Mm -hmm. uh, or you can look for Buck Institute for Research on Aging. We have a really nice website which is a mixture of science, but also outreach to the public. Okay. Uh, we have a newsletter. Uh, we have a uh, podcast. Uh, so we have uh, ways that you can sign up to come and visit the BUC. Uh, we have docent tours. Uh, there are many ways, and I hope maybe uh, in post-production you will be yeah. able to add a few links. I'll get all and... those links to all the things he mentioned and have it in the description box below the video. Wonderful. Yeah. And I invite you to join us. I think we are, uh, again, a not-for-profit organization academic uh, driven by trying to improve health for everybody mm. and 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 we need we need your support we need your help we need your not only financial but also spreading the word about what we're trying to yeah. do visiting bringing your friends and so on well i would love to bring you back on and or anyone that you recommend who works with you here at buck Happily. at some point in the future new research new findings or if you just want to go dive deeper into something this was a fascinating conversation i feel like we could talk for hours but I'm going to respect your time and your energy. So to everyone on the other side of the screen, thank you so much for watching. Drop your thoughts, comments, and questions below. I'm happy to follow up as well. Like this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't already and hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. And please share this with anyone who you think might find value in this content. Until next time. Cheers. Thank you. It was great to be here. All right. Thank you. Thank you.